morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Mina. I, um, I'm a clinical research fellow and neurology registrar from uh, UCL Huntington Disease Centre in London. Um, so I've started my PhD six, six months ago and I'm here with Hayley as well. Yeah, so I'm Hayley Hubberstein. Nice to see you all here. And I was chair of the board for three years at HDEO. So I'm not personally affected by Huntington's disease, but I have worked in the rare disease space for about six years, and particularly in Huntington's disease as well. And it was in 2019 that I went to my first ever HD conference in Romania, the European Huntington's, Associ um, Huntington's um, Association Conference, and just met this incredible community that made me feel so at home as a professional that, yeah, that's why I'm here today, because I've continued to volunteer and support, particularly HDO and young people. Um, so yeah, today we're going to go through HD 101, um, go through a number of different topics, but please do feel free to ask questions. It's not a super formal presentation, so there's something we're going through that's maybe not quite clear, or we're being too scientific, just be like, I don't, explain that again, that's fine. I was going to say, I was going to say, you're chatting crap, explain that again, it's fine. So please do stop us if it's not clear. Um, and yeah, we'll go through the background, the history, some of the genetics, some of the studies and options that are open to everybody, and then a bit about patient advocacy and how you can get involved. Cool. Yeah, brilliant. Great, so just going through some of the background and the genetics of Huntington's disease. So just to talk a little bit about kind of the DNA and the background to that. So we all have genes in our body that make up everything about ourselves, so our eye colour, our hair colour, and that's our genes that are encoded um, as part of our DNA. So I think people will be maybe be familiar with that. Um, so from a gene, you then have your messenger. So in your cells, in your body, all, all the cells in every body, you've got your genes, and they make little messengers, and they um, move through the, different, through the different parts of the cell, and then create something um, called a protein. So people tend to be familiar with proteins, because I don't know if you're maybe doing a diet, you're familiar with you should be eating more protein in your diet. So protein is in animals, just like protein is in humans, and we have lots of proteins in our body that do different things inside of our body. So that's all important, because when we talk about Huntington's disease and the Huntington gene, um, so Huntington's disease is caused by um, a faulty gene. So on chromosome four, so we have lots of chromosomes, um, in our, um, our DNA is made into chromosomes, and Huntington's disease is caused by the, the faulty gene. So what we have is everyone has the Huntington section, um, but in people um, with um, who we would say have Huntington's disease, the end of the gene is expanded, and this is the um, CAG repeat. So we talk about the CAG, which is the C-A-G, please do feel okay, free to chip in. Um, we have the CAG repeat, which is C-A-G. <laughs> so these are um, the different bases of our DNA, and it goes C-A-G, 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 again and again and again. And that's why you'll often hear about your C-A-G repeats. And if we just go back to um, this picture here, when we're talking about the C-A-G, that's on the kind of like gene side, when that goes through to be a protein, you then get all these little repeats that have built up on the end of the gene, is then becomes a really long tail, like a flappy tail on the protein, and that's what starts to cause changes in the brain with people who are gene positive and have that long extended repeat. And I will hand over to Mina, who will maybe explain some more of the technical, yeah. technical elements. So um, what's, what's amazing is in terms of how far we've come is that the gene was discovered in 1993. So in, from 1993 to where we're at now, the field and research, the, the research field of Huntington's has um, evolved and we still have a lot to uncover. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the actual, so as, as Hayley was saying, so you, we all have two copies of the Huntington gene and uh, um, in Huntington's disease, you have an expanded repeat. Um, and it's actually the protein that uh, the, the expanded, the expanded um, uh, Huntington gene and the, the protein that's made that, ha that causes the problems in Huntington. So it causes damage to the neurons. Um, and, that's, and I think that the, the unique thing about Huntington's disease is, um, compared to other neurodegenerative conditions, is that it's... Uh, got, we, know, we know the gene, and so that makes it 
Um, it's, and that's where all of the, the sort of research to try and um, lower the Huntington protein is, has come into place because it's one gene um, and yeah, that's, and I think that's what's very unique in Huntington's and really drives a, a lot of the motivation between the community, the HD community as well. Um, so in terms of the inheritance, so uh, Huntington's disease, so it's a autosomal dominant um, condition. Um, so that means um, there's, from, from going to sort of basic biology, so you can get, it's inherited through families essentially. Um, and uh, as I was saying, we all have two copies, two copies of um, a gene. Um, so if you think about it, we have a family tree here. We have this, the shaded square is an affected man and the circle is an unaffected woman. And essentially, with the father being affected, he has a 50-50% chance of passing on the gene to, the off, to his offspring. Um, and so you can see the, the effect in families through, uh, through inherit, inheritance of, of the gene. Um, so compared to other conditions, for example, uh, um, so cystic fibrosis, um, that's an autosomal recessive condition. So that's uh, different in terms of inheritance in that uh, it's, you, can carry, you can carry one copy of the gene, but you won't be affected. Um, and it's, it's, it's very different. But essentially with Huntington's, it's, it's a 50-50% inheritance. And I was just going to add as well, with the 50-50 chance, as you can see here, um, mum and dad at the top have had a number of children. It's a 50-50 chance for each child. It doesn't mean that if they have two children, one will have it and one will not have it. That's not quite how it works. Yeah. Um, so overall, say if they had 10 children, you might expect five and five or six and four, for example. But every person has that 50-50 chance. It doesn't necessarily matter what your siblings um, have tested positive or negative. Um, so, but there, I think th th there can be cases that can occur um, sporadically with no, with no family history, so that's something to be mindful and certainly in my experience in doing Huntington's disease clinics at the National Hospital, um, I certainly recall one, one, one case um, where, that ha where that's, that's happened. So, um, this is, uh, this, so we, we talked about the the CAG, the CAG repeat. So this is a slide basically talking about, so in, 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 an, in an individual that's not affected by Huntington's, uh, the, the normal CAG count would be, um, so, so the normal repeat length would be, so for, for the normal protein would be less than or equal to 35. Um, you, can, you can get different, different um, uh, uh, sort of threshold. So, if, typically, you're, you'd be considered affected with Huntington's if you had more than or equal to 35 CAG repeats. Um, there is an intermediate um, zone here, which is 27 to 35, and actually 6% of the population have intermediate alleles. Um, that doesn't mean you would, will get Huntington's disease, but there is a chance that that could be uh, the, the gene could be passed on and inherited. Um, and it may expand, so it's quite unpredictable, and it's often a grey zone and quite a difficult, difficult zone in terms of genetic counselling. Um, you also have an area called reduced penetrant, so um, if 36 to 39 CAG repeats. So that's, um, it, that is, means it's another difficult area to sort of, uh, in terms of counselling, because um, you may or may not develop Huntington's disease, and if you do develop it, it may be very late in life. Um, so that's also uh, something to bear in mind um, if you're considering genetic test, predictive testing. Um, and you, before undergoing that, you would, you would go under a lot of gen genetic counselling to sort of counsel you through these, these steps and explain it a bit more. Um, and then you have full penetrance, which is a CAG, CAG repeat count of more than 40, uh, where it would be predictive that you would ex be expected to develop Huntington's disease. And I think I'd just add as well, um, with um, Mina mentioning sometimes when um, you then have children and the repeat lengths can vary slightly. So we tend to know that maybe the parent and the child don't have the exact repeat lengths because variations can happen. Typically with juvenile onset Huntington's disease, 
that sometimes when that has happened, that the child will then have a much longer repeat and then typically, ex obviously it's not an exact science, but typically ex exhibit earlier symptoms than the parent did as well. Um, so we won't go into that in detail, but it's just to be aware that that can happen as well. But these are the main kind of uh, things to focus on. I think at this stage, it would be before moving on to sort of the next step. Does anyone have any questions at all? Yeah, go for it. Um, if a parent were to have, say, full penetrance of 40 plus pack, could then their child have less or more repeats than them? So, in terms, so that's that's a good question. Um, so the CAG the CAG repeat. In terms of inheritance, often if it's the father that's, uh, so in a condition like Huntington's, it can show you something called anticipation, um, and uh, it, from inheritance from a father, the gene can often expand and increase. Um, we know, and that's, there's a lot of research looking at to what could be contributing to that expand, the, the, the reason why the numbers expand from, if you inherit the, the gene from, from your father. Um, uh, but there are a lot of, there, there are lots of things that, contribute to the sort of stability and like inheritance pattern of the of the, the CAG. Um, do you have anything else that you could add to that? No, I think I would just say, yeah, if they're on the really lower level of like 40 repeats, that there, there is a chance, but I think it's, yeah, probably couldn't give you an exact answer on that, but it is variable. Charlie? Um, when I got my DNA results back, I tested gene um, negative, but what they strangely identified is the CAG number that I got from my dad was a 22 but because they take it from two steps of, from the parents and it presented um, that my mum actually had a uh, 28. My mum hasn't got Huntington in her family at all but the geneticist said to, you know it shows that that could and it's just interesting when you said about that jump and why mm. that jump happens and they said that she could have had it generations upon generations ago and they kind of said to me that when my son would turn 18 to come back and talk about it because he then even though i'm affected maybe he, he would have to look into his CAG number just generically to see if there would ever be a kind of jump do you kind of see that quite typically or that's I, i've not i've not come across that um myself but um i i could see why so with that sort of with that with that number why they would suggest suggest uh, that yeah. and again like obviously it's nothing to worry about but like <coughs> you said just i just find it really fascinating like the way you you know you've explained it the way that that can just suddenly just happen and obviously again it could, with the numbers it could be very reduced but yeah okay thank you Hi. just to say i find that really interesting because i did come across um a really similar example where that person it felt like a really good new result because she hadn't inherited the expansion that she had in her dad, but she had um, an intermediate on the other copy. Mm. And actually, when we did some reading around it, that isn't very uncommon in the mm. population. Well, quite a lot of us mm. might be walk walking around with an intermediate expansion that doesn't cause us any problems, but might expand in the, in the future. But especially in a maternal way isn't likely to expand in the next yeah. generation into anything that becomes yeah. affected and um, it might be yeah. several generations yeah. in, in the yeah. future that that becomes relevant so it's, it's information but and i don't know if it felt the same for you it, it was really still a good news result oh okay. it was very interesting from this from the yeah. science yeah. and it for the family in terms of generations and generations it might be interesting yeah yeah um, but the fact that she was also female was reassuring because the and jump tends to be uh, predominantly to as well tends yeah. to be seen more in men. Yeah. 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 Because like for me, it's, it's me, and then it, I've got two brothers, so that male to female. Does that fit with what? Yeah. 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 Interesting. And did did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. So just two questions. One of them was that um, historically we've been told that if she doesn't skip a generation, right? But if each child has a 50 50 percent chance of getting it and each child is it possible that each child doesn't get it then so so there there, there is a possibility yeah because the way the way the genetics works is that if if, if you'd inherit 
two children from one person that's affected could not develop, not, not carry the gene. So technically it can skip generations then? So by virtue of not inheriting the 40 gene, you, that, would, that would not be passed on? Yeah. yeah. I think only in the very, very small occasions of what the guys were talking about there. But that's just kind of to make the complete picture full. But no, in terms of it wouldn't typically skip a generation now. If the parent was um, gene negative or unaffected, the child would then be unaffected or negative. Okay, so like given, okay, if your parent is affected and you and your siblings, for example, three siblings don't develop symptoms, would that be the end of HG for the family then? In 99% in, for in for of yeah. cases, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. yeah. I don't know, because growing up, I was always just told that it doesn't skip the generation, so if you're four siblings, at least one of them will get it. No. I think it's. Stati I mean, statistically, if there's four siblings and it's like a 50 50 chance yeah. for each child, each child yeah. you would imagine one of them would, would yeah. be positive, but it's totally possible that all four would be negative. Or there's some families with nine children and eight are positive. Mm. It's, it's just it's the likelihood of it. Okay, okay. That was just the question. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the other question was that um, I guess I'm also just very unaware about it, but. Um, what's the age range of um, juvenile HD? Because, I mean, coming to this conference, I learned a lot that people's parents are experiencing HD symptoms very later in life, for example, in their 60s or in their late 50s. And coming from my family, um, my mother had it very young, I mean, in her 30s, right? Early 30s. So in my head, growing up, I was told that that's not really juvenile HD, that you're already past juvenile HD, because juvenile HD would be maybe in your teens or early 20s so coming here i've heard like some from so many different people right um that then early 30s also counts as juvenile issues so i'm just wondering what that exact age range of that would be so it depends on the onset mm. so is it 20 or 21 my, it's my understanding because it's less than 21 yeah um so that to, to, to be, be juvenile onset, onset HD. So you could be, so yeah, you could be 30 and yeah. still have juvenile HD because your onset was prior to, to the 20. age of 21. So the age of 21. exactly quantifies as onset, like when your symptoms start appearing? Symptomatic. Yeah, is it, it's diagnosed by motor symptoms yeah. at the moment, yeah. Okay, so if you get it, like when your symptoms, for example, my mom passed away when she was 45, right? So she had HD for about 15 years and she got it when she was eight, turned 30. So I'm wondering, if the, does that still count? No, back? that wouldn't be classed as juvenile onset. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Brilliant. So we'll talk more about sort of the historical aspects. Um, so this is George Huntington, um, and uh, he was a 19th century GP in North America. Um, and he first observed patients with, this, with what sounded like the syndrome um, uh, while he was following his father, who was also a GP. And so the first description of Huntington's was published by Huntington in 1872. Um, and what's really interesting is that uh, the, the discovery of the gene in 1993 was um, uh, really, uh, it was really gr with gratitude to uh, Venezuelan and uh, Neapolitan's families. Um, so they really helped uh, advance the field in terms of understanding the real gain of uh, knowledge of the effects of Huntington's in the wider community. Um, and actually, um, the, from 1993 onwards, we, we can talk a bit more about um, sort of more of the research. So I just want to talk a bit about staging. So uh, in terms of in terms of the old system, um, you. You may have heard of things, a, a stage called the pre-manifest period, um, uh, which is a, often a variable period in time uh, where you, you would expect um, anyone that's affected and carrying the gene to not have any symptoms. They, so they're symptom-free and don't have any symptoms. Um, and the period is quite difficult to sort of predict or characterise, but it's quite variable. Um, and that, that, that sort of period can last for some time. And then the prodromal period... Um, is usually where subtle signs start to appear, um, uh, and and that's again, it's a very, very uh, difficult to sort of objectively say this is this is the start of you know the, having the disease, um, uh, uh, and it typically 
proceeds, uh, comes before the, the development of motor symptoms um, by up to 15 years. And then manifest is when there's clear, clear motor signs of Huntington's disease. And there was this sort of old staging where you could sort of categorise affected uh, gene carriers by whether they were sort of pre-manifest, prodromal, or, or manifest. Um, and um, Professor De Breezy and colleagues within the Huntington's Disease Centre have come with a new staging system, um, which is... Uh, which, which is, is brought up, brought up into four, split up into four stages, where stage zero is um, essentially Huntington's disease, whereby uh, it's inherit, if you inherit the gene from birth, um, you're stage zero. And, and that's by having a CAG repeat count of more than or equal to 40. And then you have different stages. So stage one is where uh, uh, there are some, some evidence of changes within, so within biomarkers, whether it's from sort of the brain or from fluid in your body. Um, and stage two is if you have clinical signs or symptoms. And stage three is if there are effects on your day-to-day -day function. So it's a different sort of way to frame Huntington's disease. And I think this is going to um, be quite um, important in terms of clinical trials. Um, and we can talk more about that later. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think this is more similar to, I think people are quite familiar with cancer staging of different cancers. And so when we say stage zero, that might sound quite worrying to someone who's not currently got any symptoms um, and they're just gene positive, for example. But it's very much, for example, if you say had the BRCA gene, which is a breast cancer gene, for example, you don't currently have cancer. Um, so it's like you don't currently have the symptoms of HD, you don't currently have any cancer, but it's just that, that that progression will happen at some point. So just wanted to add that to make it clearer. So just going up to some of the, the some of, so the actual effects, we talked about the Huntington protein and how that can cause um, problems. So it, the, the actual, it's the actual effects of the protein that's being produced that causes the, the symptoms and signs we see with Huntington's. Um, and this is sort of just a schematic of the brain. Um, and the area of interest is um, an area called the basal ganglia, which is the part of your brain that is, um, helps with the control of voluntary movement and involuntary movement. Um, and so the overall belief is that the protein that's made sort of causes damage to neurons, and that's what leads to the symptoms. And so this is what just a, a, a diagram just showing what a normal brain looks like versus um, a, um, a Huntington's disease brain. So the damage, the, neuro, the damage to the neurons causes cells, causes loss of cells, and and um, and, that, and that's that's where we're. Yeah. Did you want to? One question: um, The Huntington disease brain that would be in the later stages when the disease has progressed. This is this is a, this is quite a late stage. Yeah. So yeah. You won't see like this type of um, MRI, for example, earlier on. Well. We'll, um, we can talk about that uh, later on, but then in some of the uh, some of the studies, we can see very before before symptoms and before um, problems. Looking quite quite early on, you can actually see very subtle changes in the basal ganglia, but not as widespread as what you would see here. Okay, so would you actually specifically be looking to see um, Huntington disease changes in the brain to identify it, or? For example, if you're already, if you if you've got an MRI done for like other reasons, mm -hmm. would the person reading the MRI specifically be looking for Huntington's to find it, or is it just something that would be very easy to read? So, so it, it's a, that's, if you're going to have an MRI for um, sort of, a, it, it depends on what the what the MRI is for. But if there was like striking. Loss of uh, loss of neurons that you could see in a scan, um, and the radiologist who's reporting it sees that they would make a comment on it. But you often, in the context of sort of clinical practice, there when you're requesting a scan, there needs to be sort of a context to why you've requested that scan, so that the person that's reporting it can look at it and understand what you're look what, what exactly they're trying to look for. But if there is something that's strikingly obvious, there would be a comment saying. Um, an incidental, they, they'd probably refer to it as an incidental finding if, if there was no context of sort of why, of, 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 of what, what, what there was but to it. But typically, would you say if it's striking enough difference to exhibit on an MRI, that person would most, very most likely have symptoms of that, demonstrating symptoms? Or? There's lots of, so 
you it can, varies. You, so, for in a loss of so in a loss of conditions, d d dementia conditions, you get loss of you get you get loss of brain. So you can't pinpoint it and say that this is this is going to be Huntington's or this person's going to have signs yeah. of Huntington's. So, yeah, it's it's very so subjective. Just, like the way that the Huntington disease brain progresses is could that be similar to other diseases as well? Like you're mentioning de dementia or even Alzheimer's, for example. So and that, that's where a lot of the research is currently looking at to see where it where does it where does it start. We we know that the basal ganglia, which is responsible for control of movements, is affected. We know that some of the frontal aspects um, are involved in some of the, the areas in the occipital lobe. Um, so in terms of the the pattern is probably going to be different based on what we understand of Huntington's because it doesn't just affect movements, it affects thinking, it affects mood. Um, so, yeah, we're still trying to uncover that. So, um, at the moment, um, in terms of treatment, so uh, we don't have any approved disease-modifying treatments. So, we, there are a number of clinical trial, drug trials going on and um, I'm, during the last two, like two days, I'm, uh, you, you may have heard about drugs called tominersin and s some other drugs, which we'll come on to. Um, so at the moment, um, there are symptomatic treatments that can help manage some of the problems with thinking, with mood, and with the movement. Um, and in terms of, this might be a, a good point uh, if, if you're happy, um, and if there's no questions, I could talk you, to you a bit about some research um, in Huntington's, unless anyone has any questions at the moment. All right, so, um, so, so at the Huntington's Disease Centre, we're, there's, we're, there's, we've, we've had funding from Wellcome to um, look into how to lower, so essentially the, the, the premise is to try and cure Huntington's, that is the ultimate sort of goal that researchers, both in the lab, clinicians, and all the participants in our studies are trying to, to work, work for. Um, so there's lots of studies looking at um, how, how, how we could do this, how we could stop the production of this, this toxic bad protein. Um, and the Tom and Erson drug that you, that you would have heard of um, during the talks over the last few days, so that's an ASO, which stands for an antisense oligonucleotide. So this is a, um, a, a, a way to, that binds to the, if we go back to what the gene was and the, and the uh, RNA, RNA. The messenger bit in yeah. the middle of that first picture. So it, it selectively targets that, which is, um, so that's one, one, that's essentially what Tom and Erson is doing. Um, and then some of, the, the, some of the studies that I'm sort of involved with is looking at the pre-manifest cohorts, so young adults um, who are asymptomatic, and that's in order to sort of determine when would be the, when would be the, the best time to start treatment to prevent essentially the condition progressing um, and also to uh, uh, sort of understand more about uh, more about what it what the the brain and the fluids um, show in the really early in the really eight early stages where we, we wouldn't expect symptoms so this is a complex slide which I don't want you to get too bogged down with but it just shows you think about it 1993 the gene was discovered and you know in last year these are all the different ways in which we can try and target this protein and ultimately all of these me methods that that you see here do they work to sort of um, break down and suppress and stop the mutant protein from being made so there's a lot a lot in there but essentially the a the premise is to sort of think target the protein reduce it and that could be a disease modifying intervention um, to either s to slow down or and, and eventually prevent the prevent the disease and I, was just gonna add as well, I think it's why when we have maybe disappointing news from a certain trial, that's, there's still a lot of hope because a lot of the therapies from the guys downstairs who are at their stands are all targeting these different pathways. So just because one particular treatment that's targeting a specific part of this pathway at that dose in that population as well isn't, hasn't been successful doesn't mean that all these other systems won't work. Um, because it's like, I don't know, getting on a bus ride, you know what I mean? You arrive at the bus station, you get on the bus, you travel on the bus, you arrive at your destination. There's all these different parts where we can try and intervene in the process. And in terms of, 
sort of during during uh, drug trials. So you, you can think of it as so people that are recruited into clinical drug trials don't just get given the drug straight away. There's a there's a process. So there's different phases of um, clinical drug trials, and the preclinical phase, which often involves sort of mass work and lab work, looks at um, to test safety of the drug of the drug uh, the drug of interest. When it goes into clinical development, it goes into a phase two trial, and that's usually looks at the safety and effects in the body. And then phase three is looking at the effects on symptoms as well. Um, but yeah, it's a long, arduous process um, uh, and often does take time. And this is just a snapshot of um, sort of all the different companies that are working on, hunt on Huntington's disease. And these are some of the approaches and drug trials that are ongoing. Um, so I think at UCL, like we're involved with these three. Um, highlighted, so um, yeah, it's a huge, huge field at the moment. And um, so, I mean, there's so much to talk about. So, and I'm worried that we're well over time. Uh, We've got but about five minutes. I think we'll take five minutes for then before the next presenter. <laughs> so, um, HE Buzz is a brilliant website. Um, so uh, this is Professor Ed Wild from UCL and uh, Dr. Jeff Carroll. Um, they both founded HD Buzz, and it's a uh, research news website written sort of in plain language, written by scientists, and it's for the HD community. I use it myself, and I always use it in clinic, and I think it's really useful to share it with, with you all today. Um, this was, I took this, I think, yesterday or the day before, um, and here we've got the, the Tom and Ursa in the phase two Tom Nursing study, that's, that's um, already underway. Um, but this is a good, hgbuzz.net is a good source if you want accurate um, and plain, plain um, updates in science. And then Enroll HD, we, we've had a talk, highly recommend it. It's the, for you to get sort of, um, uh, sort of yeah, you, it's, a, it's a good platform for you to sort of get involved in other studies and to meet more, meet more other researchers and you can, yeah, it's, it's something to consider. And I think that's really good for people. So sometimes you might find out you've got HD in your family or your friend's got HD and you're like, what can I do? I want to do something. I want to try and help. And you might feel like quite powerless that you can't affect change. But in terms of Enroll HD, anyone can take part. So people who are gene negative, gene positive, don't even have to be tested. You can be, they also have a control arm, so professionals can take part or other people can take part or maybe your husband from the other side that's not affected by HD can take part. So we'd really recommend you stop and buy their booth because when they collect data over that number of years, it enables us to have this really big picture and then future treatments will be hopefully even more successful because we have all that information. HD clarity is another type of study looking at fluid, spinal fluid collection um, and that's again to try and help with drug trial development and biomarker analysis. Join HD, which um, uh, is a global patient registry for juvenile onset Huntington's disease. Um, and it allows, it's a sort of port to connect with other um, juvenile onset Huntington's disease families to try and increase knowledge, um, identify unmet needs and facilitate future research. And there's um, Annabelle and Alexian are doing a booth um, on Join HD. Um, I think I will stop there because I did want to talk more about Yaz, but I'm worried that we're well over time. Um, but you can come and find me if you want to learn the more about downstairs. the Yaz study. But beforehand, I will just... Yeah. Yeah, so I think we just wanted to say as well, um, obviously that's a lot of the research and stuff, but I think we want to touch on the amazing community that I hope you've all seen we have in the HD community. And so there's a lot of organisations depending on which country you're in, and so please do reach out to us. I think, you know, if you have any questions at all, from the most basic to the most complicated, we do work with a lot of the, the scientists and the geneticists, and we'll be able to give you an answer if you've got any more questions. And thank you. Thank you very much for joining our talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>